And in the future, we envision you can also use a smartphone for your medical selfie. And we provide safe care for all. Hello everyone, this is Carson. I am the CEO of iSensor. I used to take daily pictures with my DSLR, but now I'm using my smartphone. And in the future, we envision you can also use a smartphone for your medical selfie. iSensor is a mobile health company that turns smartphone into a clinical grade device that allows you to check your health. We are now one and a half year into the pandemic. It changed how we will live, our work, and how healthcare is performed. In the past year, we have seen a significant reduction of emergency room visit by more than 40%. And also the utilization of telehealth surged from 2% to 35%. When people talk to their doctors, doctors ask about symptoms. However, one critical part is missing in this new normal. In the past, they can go to hospital, ask for blood test, urine test. This biomarker information allow the doctors to make the right decision. But this is simply lacking in the current telemedicine system. In view of this, iSensor has developed a technology that can turn smartphone into a device to get this clinical information. And through smartphone's connectivity, this data can be sent to cloud simultaneously. And by looking at this test result, doctors, nurses can provide their device and timely intervene. Pistol Tech, the technology platform we have built. Consider the smartphone we have. Now, now is actually much more powerful than some of the DSLR years ago. Using its camera as an accurate optical reader, along with the screen as a light source, combined with optical strip, we can check many, many of the biomarkers using the device we already have at hand. Because we are leveraging existing optical strip technology, we can quickly expand our product portfolio and turn it into a cost-effective digital test solutions. Augmented with the transmission data connectivity or smartphone, this could be an enabler for data-driven healthcare. In the past few years, we have filed more than 100 patent applications, and we got 74 international patents so far. And building on this platform, we were able to provide a decentralized testing solution. And when we first founded iSensor, one of the most asked questions is, whether it is accurate enough, whether it is suitable to convert consumer grade smartphone into a medical device. We answer this question with years of R&D efforts. In 2017, we received FDA approval for our glucose testing, which is the world's very first FDA approved smartphone camera-based blood testing. And since then, we have been using this platform technology to develop tests needed for different disease areas. Today, we, too, we have two major platforms. One to serve for people to use their smartphone to check their health at home. And the other allows professionals like doctors, nurses, to use this device to check the testing result with their patients. Over these years, we also developed a remote development platform Pixel Tech X Lab, which allows us to work with vendors of strips to develop new tests. With our analyzer, they can do the experiments at their own lab and synchronize the images to our cloud. By analyzing these images, our computer vision team can quickly develop the algorithm fitted for this strip and complete the product development in a tiny, efficient manner. With this platform, we were able to develop many biomarkers in a relatively short time. Today, we have three major areas of interest. The first one is infectious disease, the second, chronic disease management, and the third, women health management. For infectious disease, previously we have worked with Taiwan's government to fight against dengue. 
And also, we have experience developed tests for Zika. But in the past one year, we have been focusing on the development of antigen tests for COVID-19, and recently got C mark. And in, in the middle is the chronic disease management solution. We focus on the prevention and monitoring of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So far, the system allows us to check hemoglobin A1C, cholesterol, and other biomarkers for chronic disease. On the, on the right one uh, is women's health management. It has couples who want to get baby, who can use this to check the hormone level and maximize their opportunity. In the following, I'm going to go deeper into each session. Pixotate PLCT is our solution for current disease. In the past, if you want to check our health, you usually go to hospital to do a one-day checkup, and two weeks later, you come back to ask your doctor, How, what's my health situation? But now we are seeing a dramatic change in the possibility of how health check is performed. iSensor receives CEMDA for its POCT, pistol test system, for diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Previously, we have worked with Merck to pilot our testing solution in Kenya, and now it's widely adopted in modern city clinics. So for doctors to visit the patient and to perform the test immediately. In addition, we also deployed this system in more than 500 pharmacy stores in Italy. In Europe, Italy, Germany, and Spain are three special countries. People can go to pharmacy stores and to ask to perform health checkup. And Italy is where we first start by working closely with local distributor, which has a capability to do IT integration, we provide a total solution for them. So those clients of client stores, they can just walk in store and say, I want to have an express health checkup. Three minutes later, they get a result in an electronic form, saying what's the quality social level, uh, triglyceride, and also analyze its cardiovascular and risk report. And this is all be done uh, at the pharmacy store instead of having to go to hospital. If line is our version test and prison kit that help people who want to get pregnant find the best timing and optimize their chance. If line already received C mark and FDA approval, we send our proprietary AI algorithm. Once people use this product, a lot of time uh, they get smarter and get more familiar with the user's behavior. And this is right now available on Amazon, and also you can see this in CVS. It's one of US largest pharmacy chain. In addition, we also work closely with experts. In Vinan, in Taiwan, we work with expert doctors. So they can provide consultation to their customer. They check their hormone level and suggest what to do and what nutrition they can take to maximize their chance of getting pregnant. And this has been a highly successful uh, partnership in Vietnam. And we are seeing more of this kind of consultation-based trend happen in this data-connected era. And since COVID-19 started the two years ago, we have been focusing on finding the good solution to fight against the pandemic. And by solution, I mean not just the test itself, but an overall digital management system for us to fight against the pandemic. Earlier this year, uh, we have developed antigen tests with our existing POCT technology, which can sensitively detect antigen of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And with the analyzer, we can minimize human error and optimize sensitivity. And the second, the result was analyzed. It can be synchronized to the cloud our partner choose. It's in, in, encrypted the test result, operator ID, and also the test ID, and the timing, which allow it to further be used as a health pass for organizations and companies to manage the entry of buildings and for event reopening. We believe post-pandemic era, we need, we need a new citizen system to help us reopen with peace of mind. In the following, I'm going to show you a brief video that illustrates 
how the PISO test, smart antigen COVID testing, and imaging system work in, in the following video. The PIXO test POCT COVID-19 antigen test detects early infection of SARS-CoV-2 via the use of the PIXO test COVID-19 antigen test strip. With the handheld PIXO test POCT analyzer, screening can easily take place anywhere. PIXO test is highly sensitive, which makes it paramount for efficient COVID-19 screening. The test takes 5 to 15 minutes to complete and it makes no compromises on accuracy. On top of that, the PIXOTEST POCT analyzer transmits data to iSensor's PIXO Health Hub, allowing organizations the option to deploy seamless workflow integration. Utilizing the benefits of PIXOTEST and pairing with policies of pandemic management, the outbreak can be better managed by increasing accessibility and test frequency. PIXOTEST demonstrates ultra-portability, providing healthcare organizations with flexibility and capability to ramp up screening at drive through testing sites. Rapid turnaround time empowers healthcare professionals to make timely medical decisions and potentially prevent further transmissions. Utilizing PIXOTEST at airlines and international airports helps to reinforce safety measures and speed up entry screening procedures. With the PIXOTEST solution in place, health authorities can multiply testing capacity and minimize the risk of reopening borders. Potentially, travelers can be exempted from 14-day quarantine. In the workplace, PIXOTEST enables employers to rule out the risk of becoming a COVID-19 outbreak cluster. Corporations and manufacturers can scale up and automate the management of employees' health conditions as well as test results without additional investments of costly testing systems. What sets iSensor apart from conventional tests is the PIXO Health platform, taking the applicability of digital health products to a new level. Through API communication, the PIXO Health platform automates the management of health information for multiple destinations simultaneously. iSensor, the pioneer of mobile health. With this digital COVID solution, we have seen a lot of awareness, we have generated a lot of awareness uh, globally. So we are seeing report from AFP, BBC Future, Bloomberg, Mobile Health, and other media. Because what we believe is COVID has bring a significant change and we need a more sustaining system to fight against it. It's not just a fact how infectious diseases impact our life, but also impact how healthcare is delivered going forward. We are seeing current disease patients impact in the, during the pandemic because they cannot go to hospital and get what they used to have, the care they needed. And it's going to change. We have seen this healthcare being more decentralized. People now, now are going to connect from stores or, or even at home. And what they need is the testing solution to allow them to get health information timely and allow them to talk to healthcare providers and this is a new normalcy we are seeing. In the post-pandemic era, we are seeing a significant change in healthcare and how it's delivered. It's not only impact in infectious disease, but also many people with current disease. We are foreseeing in the future, people can stay at home to get a test or go to a nearby pharmacy or clinics to get the test and get the advice instantly. In the future, Mobile can be the center of personal health, and the iSensor will be the enabler for those tests to be more accessible. iSensor, pioneer of mobile health, we turn your smartphone into the center of your personal health. Hi, I'm Joseph from Flat Medical. We are a company providing the best quality, affordable, safer, and innovative devices to anesthesiologists, and we provide safe care for all. Hi, I'm Joseph 
uh, I'm happy to share my experience in Flat Medical, which is a startup company since 2016. Although Epiphase, our product name, is mentioned in the title, uh, this sharing would be more like a self-examine of our whole company to examine what we have done and what uh, allow us have the, uh, the chance to find balance between the risk and opportunity. So before we entering um, the main topic, I would like to introduce our company first. Uh, our background cover uh, mechanical engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, and medicine. At Flat Medical, it's a team came out from a biodesign program in a college. And similar to other startup companies, um, we are, we, the story was started from the unmet need. And then we joined an entrepreneurial competition with the solution. And fortunately, we won the champion. So we started uh, the company Flat Medical. We launched our first product in 2019 and uh, the, main, the main field of flat medical is anesthesiology, and we sell product to the United States, part of European, and part of Middle East. So uh, I always believe flat medical is just like an organism that is transforming and growing every day. However, in a, even in the process of transforming, I think there should be something that should be kept. Uh, we call it the discipline. We have four disciplines in flat medical. Uh, we have to recognize the strengths and weakness, and we can only focus on our main needs. And we have to verify the feasibility of new ideas as, as early as possible, and we always have to stay flexible. So let me start from the recognize the strengths and weakness. I believe everyone knows the difference between the startup and large enterprise because they, uh, it is a huge difference uh, on the uh, resources and sales channel. So we must have a list of must do and must not. In Flat Medical, uh, we built a research and design team with uh, engineer, physician, and regulatory specialist. So when we are going to evaluate uh, a new amenity, then we can have different kind of direction. And we always enhance the ability on pattern investigation and freedom to operate analysis. And we have built a, a business development team on the very early stage of the company because we need to start the networking with key opinion leader as early as possible. But we may not perform pre-market clinical trial because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we think clinical trial is not, is not important. We, prefer to perform clinical trial post-market because post-market clinical trial is much more uh, efficient and money saving and uh, it can be part of the post-market, uh, the marketing activity. And we will not try to build a factory and we will, we will not try to build a complete sales team. So after we have the list, then we have already determined the company's characteristic. Uh, that means Flat Medical is a research, design, and marketing company and will cooperate with contract manufacturer. And we have our vision, our mission. After we determined the characteristic, the next step is we have to uh, evaluate the unmade needs. So the first problem is that what is the true need? Because if, uh, after we start conversation with physicians, we find uh, 10 physicians will provide 12 complaints and 20 requirements. So what is the real needs? So we have, we can only use the uh, quantitative and the statistical data or calculation to evaluate the requirements. And we often uh, use the uh, pattern search to find, to find out what other company will do to solve uh, the same or similar problem. And we focus on the 510k product. Uh, it means we only focus on the innovation on product rather than the innovation on principle. I can provide an example here. Uh, currently, doctors use uh, the pressure change to detect the position of the needle tip. So what we provide is a new technology to help them to realize the unclear pressure change. But we will not provide them an absolutely principle, for example, electricity, because it requires a lot of effort on the regulatory which is not 
uh, which is not efficient for a small company. So let me use uh, our first product as an example. Our first online need is the epidural injection, which is very common and covers uh, painless labor, chronic pain, and surgical anesthesia. So in the US, the market is larger than uh, 12 million shots per year. And the global market value of the disposable epidural kits is higher than 1.4 billion. However, even in such a big market, there are still big problem has never been solved. That is, the physician can only rely on their manual sense to locate the needle. However, epidural space is a very thin space and just in front of the uh, spinal cord. So if the doctor uh, cannot realize the arrives at epidural space and keep advancing the needle, then the needle will puncture the dura and get into the spinal cord. It will lead to a serious headache, extreme tan, and uh, maybe a permanent paralysis. And the failure rate of epidural injection is about 2 to 5 percent. It leads to a higher than two, 280 million of additional costs just in the United States. So that is the reason why we are trying to develop Epiphase Syringe. And that is our first product. Epiphase Syringe is a visualized syringe that can provide a clear objective signal when the needle tip arrives at the epidural space. So of course, the first advantage is that it is safer because it, it can provide visualized and objective warning signal when the needle tip arrives at epidural space. So it can reduce the risk of uh, over puncture. And the second is uh, intuitive because it fit to current practice habit and it is compatible to current devices complying to the existing standards. However, this advantage is what we said, but how can we know it is true and uh, it, it will be popular in, in the market? So I think the, the only way is to test the market, uh, sorry, to test the product in a real market. Uh, so one of our disciplines is that we have to verify the feasibility of new idea as early as possible. So we will attend to medical conference in a very early stage of the product design. And we will visit, visit hospitals and even held workshops in the hospital just to gather the, the right feedback. So we have a, a strong scientific advisory board and they help us to evaluate the real amenity and to, turn, uh, to tune our design. So I still use our first product as an example. Now after we confirm the amenit, then we start to uh, make uh, several generations of prototypes. And we bring, uh, we brought the version, uh, third version of our prototype to the conference of uh, American Society of uh, Anesthesiologists. Uh, in the conference, uh, the product is popular. However, we found a curious thing that people is very, was very curious about the accessory. Uh, which is uh, a, a special syringe in a syringe design. They found the movement of the piston is very clear, so they can use it as an indication for epidural injection. So as you know, um, after two years, we separate the product into two product lines, and our first product uh, is the original uh, accessory. The last thing is that uh, we have to stay flexible. So if we are talking about stay flexible, then we should talk about the patent because patent is the key to allowing early stage exposure. But for a startup, for a startup how to balance between the patent cost and the coverage? So in flat medical, we always uh, file the US provisional patent first because uh, it is not only uh, cost efficient, but can provide you a flexible because we have 12 months to decide uh, whether to file a formal one or not. And then we will use the PCT process. The PCT will provide us uh, another 12 to 31 months to decide what country to get into the national stage. So that is the flexible. About the flexible, another thing is that we should always uh, try to find opportunity when facing challenge. Uh, for example, because of COVID-19, 
people are now sometimes uh, wears medical protective clothing for epidural anesthesia. So the, the, the use of epidural injection uh, has been reduced because it is really inconvenient to wear the clothing. But we found another thing is that when they are wearing a protect, protective clothing, their hand feeling reduced. So they cannot use their original practice, I mean the, the hand feeling. So the advantage of uh, epiphase is now even more important. So we use this as uh, so we use this and successful enter the Middle East market. So in the end uh, of, of the lecture, uh, I have shared four disciplines of flat medical. And uh, because we are in a changing world, I think everything is changing. So we often heard people say, uh, I have to change something to, to, uh, to adapt to the world. But we always think that um, we still have to think about what shouldn't be changed. Uh, what is your uh, discipline and what is my core value? So for us, I think we will keep follow the four discipline when we are trying to develop a new product or even a, a new company. And in the future, uh, we will still uh, st stay firm in Taiwan and think globally to provide safe care for all. Thank you. is to respond as effectively and as efficiently to the patient needs. We are really fostering innovation, collaboration, and excellence across the value chain. And we strongly believe that the experience with the spread of coronavirus is definitely an opportunity for more advanced technologies and betterment in the entire world's bio industry. We can see that as a big opportunity for us to find good business partners we are working very closely with Taiwan. And investing in growth and economic recovery for tomorrow. It has a common goal with Taiwan in the biotechnology agenda in the pursuit to sustainability, food security, health and wellness of the citizens. Welcome you to the Taiwan Healthcare Expo. Welcome to the Healthcare Expo. Hi everyone, I'm Hernan Cuevas Brun. I'm the marketing manager of HCMED Innovations. I have over six years of experience in drug delivery and specialize in inhalation therapy for the past three years. I'm working in HCMED Innovations, that is a startup company with lots of potential to collaborate with pharmaceutical companies around the world. A company that focuses on the design development and manufacture of mesh technology. So today I'd like to guide you through the process of inhalation therapy, just to have some background information, then explain what they are the advantages of mesh technology and lead to the drug combination product development. So without any further overview, let's start with inhalation therapy. Inhalation therapy can be described as a process of delivering a drug directly into the lungs. Now, why is this important? Well, simply by doing this, it's easier to treat respiratory diseases by locally delivering the drug into the specific parts of the airways. So when the patient inhales, the drug goes into the lungs and that reduces the dose as well as it helps with reducing systemic side effects. There are three main devices in inhalation therapy, dry powder inhalers, meter dose inhalers, and nebulizers. While the first two are easier to use in the sense that they take a short period of time, they also come with disadvantages as they require coordination when using the device, or they require a very high peak inspiratory flow. 
nebulizers do not have these disadvantages. And that is why I want to focus on this part in this, during the presentation today. Now, if we go into nebulizers, nebulizers have been around for over two centuries. The first nebulizers called jet nebulizers use air pressure to transform liquid medication into aerosol that could be inhaled into the lungs. This was very successful in the sense to delivering small molecules, but at the same time, these devices have very large amounts of residues. So then the ultrasonic nebulizers came along with smaller sizes and less uh, noise performance, but they generated heat. So this is how we get finally to mesh technology. Mesh technology is able to offer portability and other features that previous nebulizers did not have. So before continuing with mesh nebulizers, I think I should spend a little time explaining the aerosol characterization. Not all aerosol that is breathed in will actually have therapeutic effects. In order to have the drugs successfully delivered into the different parts of the airways, they have to be in a specific range of diameters. And this is usually described as the respirable range between 1 to 5 micron in diameter. What happens when we inhale aerosol? The aerosol first go through the nose or the mouth, down the upper track of the respiratory airways, and then reaching the bronchioles and the alveoli. So what we want to make sure is that these particles really target the specific sections that will help reach the therapeutic effect. Uh, now back again to mesh nebulizers. So here we have uh, this technology that started approximately 30 years ago. It consisted of a different approach to create aerosol. In this case, the liquid medication is in direct contact with a mesh membrane. And we can think of a mesh as a filter. A filter with between 1,000 and 3,000 small holes or pores through which the liquid medication goes through, becoming aerosol that can be inhaled. We use this using an ultrasonic uh, vibration that oscillates the mesh and generates the aerosol. There are two kinds of mesh nebulizers and this is based on where the piezoelectric component is placed. So we have the passive nebulizers, where the piezoelectric component is not attached to the mesh, and the active mesh nebulizer, where this piezoelectric component is also placed very close to the mesh membrane on a plate that creates the oscillation with the mesh. So now, why we need these mesh nebulizers? and what is the perception from doctors and clinicians? Well, in the past few years, mesh technology has really gotten the attention of doctors and physicians, and that's why even pharmaceutical companies these days prefer to use mesh technology in clinical trials, either for combination products or other purposes. Why do they choose this? Well, they choose it first of all because of their portability. It's easier to use them at home. They have shorter nebulization time than other devices. They are also very silent and they have higher levels of delivered dose. So less of the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient is needed to reach the therapeutic effect. Uh, as technology keeps improving, as things keep going on with mesh technology, we can start talking about new features. And that's what leads us to smart breast actuated technology. So first of all, we can focus on breast actuation. Breast actuation refers to the process of generating aerosol during inhalation only. Why is this important? Well, there are three major uh, purposes. First of all, we can reduce the waste 
that is generated during the exhalation phase. We can enhance the delivered dose that goes into the lungs. And we can also help and assist patients to adhere to their treatment throughout the process of the nebulization. If we think of why and how we do this breast activated function, we can start thinking of uh, a mechanism that is widely used by most devices, and this is having a pressure sensor. So what happens is that when a patient inhales, there will be a pressure change in one of the channels of the device. Now this immediately triggers the sensor and starts generating aerosol. There's a threshold out of which when the patient is getting close to the last part of inhalation, the device will immediately stop and the exhalation process begins. Now, no aerosol is coming out because in this specific point, we have a higher pressure sensor, a higher pressure that eventually leads to wait for the respiratory cycle to finish and initiate the next one to start generating aerosol again. Fugitive aerosols in recent years, uh, more specifically since the COVID-19 pandemic started, have really attracted lots of discussion in the medical field. Why? Because uh, fugitive aerosols are not only the aerosols that are generated during exhalation, but they are also the aerosols that are coming out or excel from the respiratory airways if they did not properly deposit in the lungs or uh, the different parts of the respiratory system. So this is potentially detrimental to the health of people who are surrounding those receiving their nebulization treatment. And that's why breast actuation can reduce these uh, negative effects of fugitive aerosols. Now, the other special feature is Bluetooth connectivity. We are living in a digital world, and this really brings lots of benefits to patients. What does this mean? Uh, in inhalation therapy, we are trying to assist and improve adherence by providing new solutions that mostly come together with uh, Bluetooth connectivity. We can put this at add-ons on devices, or the Bluetooth modules can be directly embedded into the devices. Now, uh, by doing this, we can see when the patients are doing their treatment, we can see if they are doing effectively, and we can also check on other educational material that we can provide with these devices. So when we improve uh, patient adherence, we are trying to guide the patient to adhere to its specific times of treatment to improve the treatment efficiency and also educate them to have uh, their material ready, all their information ready to be shared with doctors or healthcare practitioners. The idea is that at some point we'll be able to share data on real time to really help with the progress of different kinds of patients that suffer respiratory diseases such as asthma or COPD. So now with mesh technology and the features that we are involving, we come to the point that leads more to the regulatory side. And this is the drug device combination. In drug device combination, we are talking about having a nebulizer and a in a drug. And this drug can be specifically tailored for a customized device to enhance drug delivery and have optimal performance. So this specifically requires pharmaceutical companies as well as device manufacturers to work together and find the best way to deliver solutions that will benefit lots of people who suffer common diseases as well as more recent rare diseases that are affecting people, especially in the respiratory field. So as the prospects of 
mesh technology combination products in the future of how we will incorporate all of this, we can first highlight that mesh technology offers a deeper and better lung deposition than other nebulizers. They are highlighted by their portability, their silent um, operation, and at the same time, they can come together with these two new features mentioned, the breast actuation and connectivity. Uh, by having the Internet of Things connected and bringing us more value, especially to these devices, we can further see that uh, asthma and COPD treatment can also be treated more efficiently, as well as new biologic treatments that will require the delivery of proteins, peptides, and uh, other substances such as uh, mRNA. Inhalation therapy is a very exciting field that allows us to work with pharmaceutical companies around the world, that allows us to offer new solutions with therapeutic effects to people who suffer from respiratory diseases around the world. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed it. Hi everyone, I'm Hernan Cuevas, Marketing Manager of uh, HCMED Innovations, and today I have the pleasure to be joined by two very distinguished professionals. First of all, we have the CEO of iSensor, uh, Carson, and we also have the CEO of Flat Medical, Joseph. Uh, Joseph, yes. <laughs> uh, so there are two questions that we want to treat in this panel discussion. And I think we can go right into the first one. Mm -hmm. So uh, it relates to what are the most critical changes that could be applied to the companies and the healthcare field uh, to have a more efficient future in its development of medical devices or the new solutions for the medical field. Mm -hmm. So if it's okay, we can start with Carson. Sure, sure. So uh, I myself was in the uh, field of telemedicine almost 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, I, I built a PDF-based uh, system for testing SPO2 and the ECG. However, uh, at that time, we think there are a lot of missing components for telemedicine to actually materialize, uh, like uh, regulatory, like uh, the availability of data connectivity, uh, mobile device, and reimbursement. So. Until last year, we are seeing, seeing a significant change because of COVID-19. So we are seeing uh, MI vaccine. Uh, this technology hasn't been widely used before this pandemic. But because of the, the pushing needs, the regulatory agency are willing to have a quick approval process, giving the uh, flexibility. So that's what leads us where we are today. So now we have innovative vaccines that can help us fight against the pandemic. Going forward, I foresee a regulatory agency remains a critical part for innovation because in the past, this kind of innovation is typically challenged by regulatory agencies. But now, because of this pandemic, they have been more flexible, been highly efficient to try or approve new, new drugs, new vaccines, and new, new devices. And we are seeing, uh, as we t move toward to future of health, this will be a critical part for us to transit to a more innovative healthcare to face the future of health. Great, thank you so much. Uh, what about you, Joseph? Um, I think this is an interesting question for me because I come from Flat Medical, which is a startup company. So, you know, we are uh, changing, adjusting, uh, modification and growing every day. So we often ask ourselves, what should not be changed rather than what should be changed? Yeah. However, uh, because of the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, we have seen a lot of change. And one of the most important things that I think the pandemic has already uh, changed the way people interact. So we have to learn uh, how to survive in the new rule of the people interaction. So uh, for, just for example, for us, um, because uh, currently it is difficult to enter a hospital to promote to prom promote your product, and it is hard to uh, discuss your prototype with physicians. 
So, uh, and we also seen a lot of uh, online, uh, I mean, the virtual conference. So we made two improvement. Uh, the first is that uh, we have uh, modified our regulatory process. So now we can direct or via the uh, distributor to deliver a very small package to the hospital. And we um, made our new uh, Fenton. So they can use it, a portable small one, in their daily training. And it is really popular. So with this, uh, our distributor can still promotion our product, even in a pandemic. And another thing, just for example, that like uh, we started to uh, make our own uh, homemade 3D uh, demo video. And uh, since the start of the since the start of the pandemic, uh, we have already built the complete ability to make an elegant demo video. And that, this is a, uh, this, this is uh, essential for us because part of flat medical is just like a, a design house. We always have to uh, evaluate evaluate a new uh, our main need and uh, show the physicians our new uh, concept of solution. So currently, we only need uh, seven days after we have a new idea, and we can use the demo video uh, efficient uh, discussion with the physician or even with the FDA uh, authorization. And uh, that are only two uh, examples. But what I would like to say is that uh, if ask me what should be changed, I think we have to uh, change to follow the new rule of the way uh, people interact. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think definitely the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has changed the way in which we do things. It has pushed digitalization, mm -hmm. it has pushed reforms and also the regulatory process to try to make it more flexible. And those are good things moving forward uh, for efficiency, at least in the medical field and healthcare. So now going into our second question, I think this goes more to each one of uh, your companies, uh, since it relates to an experience that uh, you wish that you could, um, at that time, if you wish you could have done things differently to get probably a better outcome and make a better progress for your company. So if it's okay, we start again with Carson. Sure, sure. So I think uh, not only for startups, but also for mature companies, one of the most critical thing is that whether you are building the right solution for pushing needs. And for, for this one, we first start because we are developing an innovative solution. So in the very beginning, we, we try to make first make some assumption and to test with stakeholders. And it's, it's a fancy process, but it, it, I think it's also a vital step for that. So over this period, we gradually build the product and go into market and get feedback and to, to revise it. Uh, it. It takes us some time uh, until I uh, think two, two years ago, we identify a new, uh, new way to help us to identify our needs and uh, get feedback quickly to optimize the solution as well. So uh, in the past two years, we, we were pri privileged to be able to attend a uh, accelerator by big pharma like uh, Merck, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and also have the pleasure to work with Roche during the startup start Chris Fear. And for take uh, Merck accelerator, for example, uh, for those three months, we were able to uh, recite within Merck and talk to different people from different departments to understand uh, what they need. For example, if they have a certain drug, they might need a testing solution, help them to screen their potential customer, or something that people can use at home so to monitor their situation. So this allows us to uh, focus more accurately how we should allocate our resources. And also, in, in the uh, early time of developing a product, we can get, we can get validation from doctors and the potential customers. I think uh, this kind of new uh, practice helps a lot to make the overall product development more efficient. And we, we are also more certain about once we finish this product, how can we uh, successfully commercialize it? Thank you again, Carson. Uh, Joseph? Um, in fact, it is a tough question for me because, you know, startup always makes mistakes, but we always do uh, adjustment. 
Uh, however, uh, the first thing that came into my mind is that uh, the we, we have a struggle on the, uh, on the quality system, on the establish of the quality system. Uh, back to 2017 to 2018, uh, we were uh, applying for the ISO uh, 13485. And as a rookie, we cooperating with, uh, 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 with a third party uh, consultant. And we use their template as our regulation. And it uh, became a disaster on our first uh, our first audit. The auditor who is came from uh, who came from British Standard Institution, uh, he was shocked. Uh, he, he found uh, our regulation is dif is different from our product plan. In that in that moment, we haven't have any product, but we have our plan, and he found that is absolutely different. Mm -hmm. So uh, we make a very big mistake that. Um, we use their, We only made minor modification on their template. But what should we do is to uh, is to uh, find find the first hand information by ourselves and read the information and read the template and have our own regulation. So after that, we it cost us uh, about one year to modify our original uh, regulation because you know it is it's even difficult to to modify an exist. Uh, regulation, then made a new one. So it cost us so many time. So if ask me what what is the uh, if one thing that I I hope to do it again and I can do it better, I think that that is our experience. Okay, yeah, De definitely this is um, something that happens with startups and just like Carson said, it can also happen with big mm -hmm. corporations that um, sometimes we get into some small issues and then we have to resolve them. And hopefully these help us do things better the, the yeah. next time. Yes. Well, thank you so much for uh, this very interesting discussion that we just had. And I uh, appreciate your time and also having the opportunity to know more about both of your companies. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.看到了很多同行开始跟我一样把这些大数据跟 希望有更多这些资讯相关的IoT的device 
My name is Ted Huang. I'm Patient-Centric Innovation Manager at AstraZeneca Taiwan. I'm going to share with you how to build a partnership with multinational companies through stakeholder analysis and through understanding their really needs. So I know most of the startups or SMEs in Taiwan are looking for to build collaboration with uh, big companies such as uh, Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, uh, uh, Pfizer, or AstraZeneca. But most of them put 100% efforts on finding the clinical um, main needs. I'm here to put you, uh, give you a different perspective to urge that not only uh, to focus on um, clinical um, main needs, but also on um, main needs of your target clients. And I'll explain you why about that. So for today's content, we have two points. The first one is multinational companies' external innovation considerations. Uh, from this angle, you may be able to uh, understand more from a multinational uh, companies' perspective and also why they are scouting or why they are looking for different solutions externally. And second, I'm going to give you a tool which is dynamic stakeholder analysis, which is a very useful uh, technique to help you to understand which, what kind of the ecosystem or the environment you are in and how you can play with the ecosystem and to leverage to build the partnership with these companies. So uh, when it comes to multinational companies, external innovation considerations, I think most of the important things, they are thinking how to boost sustainable growth or how to build competitive advantages, which is extremely important for their business. So again, this is not only about to make the revenue or how to beat the competitor for these multinational companies, but more about to build a sustainable growth. And this is, um, concept is quite important is that it allows us to dissect what does it mean for uh, sustainable growth. We can dissect this into three pillars. The first one is organic growth. The second one would be gain share or gain market share. And the third one would be new product development or new business development. As for organic growth, we can also dissect this into few points. The first one would be um, take um, uh, uh, surgical uh, business as an example. For Medtronic or Johnson & Johnson uh, or Ethicon, this um, business unit, they will see uh, organic growth from different perspectives. The first one would be like what kind of new surgical methods or what kind of techniques, what kind of skills they can uh, urge or, or they can promote through support from the key opinion leaders or surgeons. And is this possible for them to increase or expand their indication for their medical devices, which can generate a bigger market for them. So in this way, they will think how we can really uh, make the pie, the market pie, even bigger. Not only to share a bit about it, but more about how we can make the pie bigger. So this way they can uh, increase their organic growth. And second approach they will think about is by product. So they will think what kind of product, what kind of portfolio for current or for the future, and what kind of product we can um, play with within this um, current market. And again, this is about how the ways to increase the CAGRs of this overall market size. For the gain share part, it's more, more about the traditional understanding about the marketing. So it's about not only about the marketing communication, but for example, like market access, they will think how they can uh, make the price even better and better in the next few years uh, under the huge pressure of the uh, local health, Ministry of Health uh, surveillance or uh, uh, regulations or reimbursement system. They will think in terms of the portfolio, product portfolio, how we can really um, uh, maintain uh, a certain uh, degree of competitiveness and also increase the market access to the region, to the hospital, and even to the key opinion leader or the end user. So this is their uh, way of thinking. And the second part would be like a key opinion leader or key account or hospitals engagement. How we can leverage external partnership to have a better engagement with uh, those 
key stakeholder within the environment. This is crucial sometimes for them because it will benefit back to their market access part. And the third part would be um, distributorship integration. So like uh, online and offline or um, different regions uh, or different types of distributor, how we can uh, increase the synergy through integrating the resources and integrate uh, their, um, their, their advantages within this region, within this market. The, the third pillar would be new product development or new business development. For multinational companies, they will think their product, not only single products, but more about the whole portfolio management, the current portfolio management and the future portfolio management, which will give them a dynamic uh, perspective about how they can forecast or foresee the future about the market. So they will see how is the, the, the future star and in terms of how we can uh, create a new way of um, surgical methods or how, uh, how we can um, change the frequency of using these kind of medical devices or th this solution. And so that through this process, we can alter the whole portfolio line. And this is different perspective from, um, from, from most of the startups uh, point of view. And the third point, I think it's also quite interesting, uh, is called strategic sacrifice hit. So for these companies, um, they will see a product portfolio as a whole total solution offering to the um, uh, stakeholders or to the end users. Again, take a surgical um, uh, business as an example. Like Troka is, is a, uh, a device to, which can be, be used to help uh, surgeons to access into the patient's body. Uh, for this kind of product, actually for, um, for uh, like uh, Johnson & Johnson or Medtronic, these uh, big giants companies, they will see this product just like a uh, sacrifice here sometimes in some market because for the government reimbursement rate is quite low and sometimes they cannot uh, make any profit about it. But if the startups, they only put 100% of their efforts trying to find the best way or trying to find a main needs about this troca, which may give a not really profitable or market sizable um, uh, result. So, so sometimes for this kind, kind of product, uh, if startups can alter their thinking, alter their mindset to change this product into a how we can design a product to fit the multinational company's uh, total solution uh, fit could be another way to think about it. And the fourth uh, point about the uh, new product development is companion solution. Uh, for example, some uh, new drug or innovative drugs, before using that, patients need to, be, uh, ha to, 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 to have a uh, genetic testing or genetic uh, consultation. For this kind of solution, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies will be extremely interested to have this kind of partnership with uh, this companion solution or genetic companies to co-build this solution because this is a companion solution. It's like a precondition before using their drugs. So from this uh, 10 different considerations, startups can uh, find a different approaches or find, find different value proposition about their products. In all, uh, there are a few points uh, to think. The first one is for multinational companies, they would like to expand the overall market size, not only to competing within the similar or the current status of the market. And second point, sometimes they need public relations. They need to do some corporate social responsibility, which also indirectly give them a leverage point uh, on market access, on uh, KOL or KA engagement. And third one would be supply chain synergy. They can increase either uh, operation efficiency or increase their uh, cost effectiveness. And the fourth, the lastly, would be uh, competitive advantage. Through these approaches, they can build, or through this uh, partnership, they can build the competitive advantages. So understanding uh, what is the considerations about the multinational companies, and then we also need to understand what kind of options that multinational companies have. They either can do nothing, they can early introduce their new pro 
pipelines through their own facility, or their own manufacturing site, or they can license in or license out, or even JV or, or emerging acquisition. But I think also most important thing for the startup or for SMEs is to really understand what is your value proposition about your solution from different point of view. I think um, innovation means three guards. In the outer layer is market access, which means reimbursement, pricing, uh, regulatory affairs. If your products can bring in this kind of value to the multinational companies, it will lay in a market access guard. And the second layer I think is extremely important uh, for startup is the commercial innovation. And I think most of the um, startup need to also focus not only on clinical maintenance, but also on commercial innovation, because you will bring in uh, different viewpoints when you uh, design uh, your product, and even in the POC stage. So for commercial innovation, there are some like market coverage in terms of number of hospital, number of user, or number of stakeholders, or the distributorship digitalization, operation synergy, or strategic alliance or partnership. In the middle, it will then be product innovation, or we call it a main needs. So what I'm going to say is that most of the uh, companies or startups, they put so many times and effort and resources on finding the main needs. But remember that multinational companies, they also put the same energy on finding maybe the same kind of uh, the same direction of our main needs. So maybe you can think about what kind of um, gap that uh, multinational companies cannot do that maybe you can bring in. So leverage point usually lies in not only the uh, product innovation, but also commercial innovation. Okay, so for dynamic uh, stakeholder analysis, I think this is a very useful tool to help you guys to understand or to discover the business opportunities. Let's take an AI related, AI ECG startup ex as an example. So you may use different kind of tools or metrics. Here I use, uh, 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 you, you can see on the left hand side, um, you can put a uh, use case and also the patient journey in different X and Y axis to see what kind of uh, uh, business or what kind of uh, stakeholders are within this whole market ecosystem. In this slide, you can see Omron, they focus on retail uh, business and focus on diagnosis uh, business. And there are some other multinational companies like GE, they also uh, occupy different uh, side of this um, matrix. And then with this uh, whole picture, usually we can see, have a clear uh, map saying that what kind of players, uh, what kind of competitors we are facing, or what kind of partners we can build the business. But I think the most important thing is the, 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 the angle you can see. I think to focus on what kind of dynamic that these companies are focusing on uh, is also very important. Because for example, you can see uh, for Omron in the next three years or five years, which market or which use case or which patient journey they would like to uh, move to or they would like to expand to will bring in more value about uh, your about this startup's business so they can uh, structure uh, where uh, they should play with. And after have this clear mapping in a more dynamic way, we can then define the priority of the target clients. Who are the uh, key payers that uh, we have more um, uh, opportunities to win, right? Um, and then you can also think, uh, what is their uh, target uh, or stra strategic focus in the next few years from the point of view of uh, government affairs, market assets, or what kind of resources they would like to uh, acquire. And then for startup or for multi uh, SMEs, you may think uh, what kind of uh, business development strategy we can leverage. For example, sometimes this, this um, flow of thinking will help you generate a totally different um, idea from the first beginning. Right? So 
uh, and maybe some some of these solution may be totally different from uh, what you can imagine in the in the past. For example, we may come up with a solution saying we, we should leverage the AI technology to the home care device giant uh, with a um, limitation within the certain market. So this is like a limited um, uh, license in or license out strategy uh, in this market, and we can also segment the market in different ways. So at last, lastly, I would like to, um, to give some reminder uh, for doing the business development or doing the startup business uh, uh, with uh, uh, multinational companies. We should define needs through understanding, through understanding what uh, multinational companies they are focusing on, what, what is their business challenges, hurdles, and what, where is the opportunity you can uh, leverage with. And the second point would be knock the door with relevant value proposition rather than only stressing on your own technology or your skills or your uh, product, but more think from uh, your counterpart's uh, viewpoint. And lastly, find a key person with support of right partner. Sometimes uh, the key person is not necessary to be the big boss of the uh, potential client, but uh, but from um, a uh, really supportive uh, people and willing to who who is willing to share their uh, insights and to really uh, precisely brief what they need to you, and I think this is the right partner that you should you should uh, focus on. And thank you so much. This is my talk. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm the user experience director from Jubo and I'm responsible for the product design of long-term care solution. And I'm here today to share our Jubal Telecare platform and its design. So we try to connect the data and the services to apply the use case in the home care situations. So we all know the world is aging. In Taiwan, in, in 2020, for everyone senior, it takes for young people to support their living. And in the next two decades, there will not be enough care workers to provide services. And it's not just happening in Taiwan, but also in other developed or developing countries. Jubal recognized the situation and is dedicated to developing digital tools that can help increase care professionals' care efficiency and capacity. So in the past two years, we have built the nursing information system and the daycare management system to help reduce nurses and social workers' workload. But we are also aware that there are still some 800,000 seniors who are right now being taken care of at home, either by the family members or by caregivers dispatched from home care agencies. However, the care quality can sometimes be very problematic, and it doesn't really help much to relieve the seniors' uh, care stress in the long term. So based on user-centered approach, we start by asking what happened to the family caregivers and what pain points they are suffering right now. So in the past year, we have interviewed more than 10 families and brought back the observation we collected on site and discussed with our technology team and business team to brainstorm the best solutions. From the research, we can target our primary user more precisely and then mapping out their journey so that we can better understand what they do, what they think, and how they feel. So as you can see in the customer journey map, in Taiwan, the primary care decision maker is often the partner of the disabled, and their age is around 50 to 70 years old, who's also undertaking part of the care work, if not at all. The journey starts from the disabled being discharged from the hospital, and the family member has to search the care services to consult and to compare the possible solutions. So if we further zoom in on the map, we can identify each of the major pain points during these stages. From searching to consulting care services, it takes a lot of time and efforts for the family caregivers to process the information, and it's often a back and forth process before the final decision is made. However, after adopting the service, there's another issue, is how to monitor the care quality at home. So for families with higher expectation of care delivery, is now often less than satisfactory using the government funding services. 
So the senior is at best maintaining their current health conditions, but with less hope to recover part of their daily activity functions. Therefore, we identify two opportunities in Jubal Telecare Solution. One is to help fi family find the services that match their expectation. And the other is to provide caregivers with digital tools to track care quality at home so that they can better collaborate with the care professionals remotely. So by creating a transparent and trustworthy platform, we aim to bridge the care service gap in demand and provision, as well as the quality control after the service is adopted. So that it will help the family to find the right care professional teams at the right time, and also provide them with the tools that can collaborate with the care professionals more easily. So that the timely interve intervention for the senior can be finally made. Jubal Telecare Platform helps the family decision maker select the most suitable care professional team. So by providing essential information, such as care needs, current health conditions, expectation, and also budgets, Jubal pl Platform will then filter the talent pools and recommend the care service package to the families, and also provide for the digital tools to ensure home care quality. And after the service is adopted at home, we also provide the digital tools to help the caregivers ensure care quality. So it includes the smart care note, including the vital sign measurement automation and daily care checklist. And all the data will be synced to the cloud and sent to remotely to the care professionals so they can monitor through the dashboard. So the care professionals can receive the timely care risk alerts and also from the data collected at home, they can try to compare the wounds differences of the medication the senior is taking right now, as well as their differences in the mental self management. So through the integrated care plan, they can deliver the better care services to the families. So as for the family care decision maker, we also help them to monitor the care quality by providing them with the care quality reports and also the progress tracking. So how we provide the Stakeholders, including the families, the caregivers, and the care professional, is by letting them to share and exchange the information remotely so that the care delivery can be more smoothly be done. Jubal Telecare Platform bridges the information gap and helps the collaboration between the families and the care professionals. I'm Jen from Jubal, part of the global business development team. I aim to bring Jubal's product and solutions to worldwide and to serve those in need. I love travel, I love yoga, and I love cats. Today, I'm going to share about Jubal's AI practices and care. AI truly makes us reimagine how we can better integrate telehealth in virtual care setting. We are currently seeing a trend that a new digital infrastructure to be introduced to care. The new infrastructure help 
streamline the process of data collection and analysis, making the calculation and the machine training models operate more efficiently. The outcomes are crucial to every decision making in the care process. Under this new infrastructure, we are able to uh, make huge impact with AI. It helps enhance person-centered care and quality care. The individual's, individual's difference in health condition and potential risk can be easier to identify, and follow-up works to provided by care professionals can be executed in much easier way. AI also help build good communication and trust in collaborative care, not only in between the care professionals, but also for the communications between care professionals and the families. More importantly, AI can help predict the future delivery of care. Now, I will give more details on each expert. So, as we talk about the new uh, infrastructure of AI, data is definitely the foundation. Care is complex and evolved with many data. Therefore, we need a data hub that enables uh, automated data collection and data management. In a home care setting, the activity sensors installed at home can keep track of the changes in residents' activities such as sleep quality, fall detection, and vital checking. We have records, logs, and signals from those devices. Whenever a caregiver enters the house, the vital sign measurements is conducted via the medical devices, and several data types need to be collected. For instance, the blood pressure, the body temperature, the blood oxygen, and blood glucose. With so many data involved, Jubal creates an all-in-one data hub, Smart Care Note, not only retrieving data across different devices and sensors automatically, but integrate the nursing records of the resident. AI helps shape person-centered and quality care. By identifying individual difference and abnormalities in more real-time manner, the care professionals can save more time and focus on the right care service delivery. For instance, one of the Jubal AI applications, vital sign abnormality monitoring. In general, vital signs should be measured at least twice a day. However, just because of the sensitivity and the familiarity to the resident is needed, the caregivers actually sees it as a very challenging task. With Jubal AI, the personalized vital sign abnormality is calculated and turns into a standard range. And it can be established right away. Under the mix of data sets, such as current vital sign records, personal profiles, such as gender, age, tube usage, medical medication, and previous vital sign records. And after the calculation, the abnormality alerts will be triggered in real time when the standards is exceeded. Then the care professionals can provide timely intervention, set reminders to recheck, and set up follow-up tests to ensure the care quality. Also, AI enhances trust and communications in collaborative care. With leading index and information transparency, care professionals and families can communicate better. There's another example from Jubal is the AI model of VASOR image detection and analysis for wound recovery scenario. In general, wound care has very huge impact on the senior's quality of life. While wound recognition and recovery record is also very time consuming for the care professionals. Families and care professionals, they take a lot of time to understand the status of the wound. And also there is a very complicated record to actually know the recovery status of the wound. 
But with Jubal AI, families and care professionals can easily just use mobile devices to take wounds photos and learn the recovery status. All the detection and recognition are detected by AI. Then the information details such as severity, color, shape, and size can be easily transmitted and communicated well. Last but not least, AI predicts the demands and delivery of care. It helps streamline the process from assessment, diagnosis, to service matching. The best example is Jubal's AI implementation for the complicated procedure of personal health risk assessment. There are tons of data types to consider in order to generate a risk assessment of a specific person. By implementing Jubal AI feature, home care agency and case family can easily insert data such as body assessment, current disease status, tube usage, and living environment attributes. Then the data will be sent to Jubal AI Cloud for calculation and then generate a risk report indicating potential risk with its incidence rate. Then with the report in hand, the home care agency can further evaluate and tailor the right service for its customers. All in all, the AI applications are beneficial to the facilitation of virtual care. In Jubal's solution roadmap, from smart care note to monitoring and assessment type of AI practices, to the ultimate goal of providing on-demand care recommendation and delivery. These overall workflow can de definitely drive the virtual care onto the next level. Let's reimagine telecare with AI. Everyone ages, everyone needs care. Think about it not only for your family, but also for yourself. Hello, everyone. We're very happy to invite two of the very, very young and uh, um, talented um, experts uh, at Jubo today to share with their, their uh, startup experience. So welcome. Um, would you uh, introduce yourself a bit and also introduce the company about Jubo? Maybe Derek first. Uh, hi, I'm Derek, and I'm the user designer in Jubo. And I'm primarily responsible for the product design of the long-term care system and daycare systems. And Jubo is on its way to expand their product uh, ecosystem to home care services. So right now, we are also striving to uh, build a telecare platform that helps the family caregivers. They can have a much better services. Thank you. Jen. Hi, I'm Jen from the global business development team of Jubal. Uh, so I currently working closely with the North America business team um, in helping the product of Jubal to be able to serve more people around the world. And uh, very excited to be in a strategic partnership with all over the world. For example, the, those in Japan and Singapore and many more to come in Middle East. So very excited to bring the Jubal's next gen product to the next stage. Awesome. And congrats on the great job. And I read uh, recent news uh, about the close the founding and uh, also congrats on the new business development overseas. Um, so I would like to uh, ask Jen about like, uh, uh, what do you foresee Jubal uh, three years later? That what is your vision uh, about the Jubal company and what is the future goal? As I see, Jubal is a very interesting company uh, with its very profound vision to serve in long-term care industry. Um, so um, everyone, as everyone may know, uh, Taiwan is um, one of the fastest growing aging society in Asia. So currently what we are developing is actually two steps or three steps forward than others. Uh, others. So um, with our pilot experimental um, research in Taiwan, um, we can see it as an advantage to take our product to the next level. 
and we're able to serve many more uh, countries and with a more solid business strategy and more solid um, products structure. So very excited. And uh, within three years, we are foreseeing ourselves to be more mature uh, in Southeast Asia, in uh, Eastern Asia, like Japan. And of course, um, the current uh, relationship we have in North America can also help us to get more understanding of the uh, regulatory compliance, such as piracies and uh, security issues, and also um, the maturity in the business cycles. So um, these, I think, these are the challenges for us in the three years, and we are very excited to uh, confront and to face. Nice. And how about from perspective of product development or user experience, do you have anything to share, Gary? Uh, I think in our long-term vision, we are trying to break the information silo that's right now existing in like a different information system has to talk to each other, but there's no way for them to do this better. So we try to base our product on a resident or a senior based design so that the information they can bring with them to quite wherever they go. Either they chose to stay in the care facility or stay at home. So the data is always with them so that we can provide them with a better feedback of how the data tell them about their health conditions and to help the professionals to make a better care decision and to intervene more timely. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And also in order to reach the three years goal that uh, Jen also just shared, I'm just curious that uh, what kind of changes or what kind of um, uh, business activities that you will need to do uh, internally or maybe externally? Maybe Jen, you can share first. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, I think for the changes we have to make, uh, firstly, um, and most importantly, um, is um, our connection to the global stage. Uh, so as, the, as a company currently headquartered in Taiwan uh, with, um, with many uh, networks outside of Taiwan, uh, we need to be aware of not locking ourselves in our own boxes, but uh, to explore and to keep uh, open to any kind of uh, new stimulation. Yeah. And uh, also the talents will be a very important factor to us for our further global expansion. So how, uh, how the company um, based in Taiwan to acquire or attract more talent from a global stage, it's also something we have to work on very hardly. And the ch uh, challenges we are facing right now in the society in general is like we are in shortage of care for us. So uh, there's not enough uh, caregivers to provide the services. And also many people don't think it's like a noble professionals. So that not many, many people, they devoted themselves to this kind of career. So we try to, the challenges we are facing right now in, uh, besides to letting people know like uh, care, you, you have to take care of uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we, uh, the challenge is how we reshape the working environment for the caregivers because right now they don't think maybe they, the, the job is noble enough. So we try to develop a digital tools to help them and empower them so they can de deliver more service to more people so that people will respect it as a career. Gotcha. Yeah, I think the, the answer is quite interesting. I, I mean, from for, for Derek, you, you, you mean that uh, for market education is quite important for you to educate not a user, but let the, the whole environment understand this career of your clients means really something that's so in the future, maybe in this market can be more and can, can grow healthier in the future. So for Jen, I also uh, really 
um, appreciate your answer regarding the talent acquisition for Taiwanese companies. Always a big challenge is how you can, you would like to, to expand your business in, in, internationally, but also you need to have more insights from not only from Taiwan, but from other countries and uh, to acquire local insights, acquire local talents is one of the most important thing. And I totally agree with that. So uh, my, my next question would be, um, if you can change something, uh, in the past, I mean, for startup, we have facing so many different difficulties and challenges every day, uh, and com dealing with complexity is another thing, right? So, if you can really fly back to the past and change something, what would that be, Jen? Well, we think um, it's actually a very blunt answer, but I would say. Uh, if we fly back again, we probably will follow the same route just because uh, you never know what happened next. And what we can do is always gather all the resources you can have and just to uh, just to make it happen. Uh, so even uh, even for now, looking back on what we've done, um, it's quite challenging journeys but the method we tried will, will still be there. And uh, we we'll just need to make more efforts to, to tackle all the challenges uh, uh, in front of us. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah definitely. And Derek? And I totally agree with Jen about like, uh, it's not like uh, what we have, could have done differently, but what we could have done more. So as a user experience designer, we're always facing the failure because we get a lot of criticism either from inside of the company or from the user. But we know it's like a better approach for us to find the real truth, like what really works. So not until we have done more, we could, we could not really find the answers. So we think uh, if we go back to like three years ago, we should have done more experiments and tried to probe the market, like to know more about the users and know more about the markets. Thank you. And I also would like to ask more um, further questions like, what keep you um, awake at night? What is the burning challenges currently? Maybe uh, Derek first. It's like you are always self-doubting whether the things you are doing, like the user will really appreciate or the market will appreciate because we, we try to do something really useful. And it's not just like something we imagine in our brain, but we have to like prove it from the user's perspective. So let what keeps me awake at the night. Yeah, thinking about these yeah. questions, yeah. which I, I may not have answers immediate, immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And not only thing, you need to do something, right? Yeah. So many different initiatives so much different experiments. Yeah. Cool. And Jen? Yeah, I think uh, self-doubt is very common on the entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so I dare not to say I always have good sleep, but uh, I think the most important thing is how to better um, strengthen your confidence in yourself. Uh, even things may fail, uh, you need to find a way to put, it, put yourself together again so that you are uh, a warrior again tomorrow. Uh, so uh, I think what keeps me awake at night... Not your boss, right? Not my boss, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Just call every day. <laughs> but I think um, I will ask myself if, uh, if I have already uh, put at full force for myself every day. Yeah. If yes, then I'm satisfied. Cool. I think your boss is quite lucky to have you work with them. <laughs> so I guess my last question would be, if you can give one word about Jubo's company culture, what would that be? Jen? Uh, in one word, yeah. um, I would choose uh, persistence um, so there, this word, I think, can de definitely symbolize not only the industry that Jubo is in currently, 
which is long-term care, a very difficult issue to tackle. But also it symbolized the um, very entrepreneurial journey that uh, we have to keep the, the strong mindset to get together. Okay. Derek? And uh, I would say it's in one word, right? Or maybe three, is that okay? <laughs> uh, it would be ambitious. So we are trying to do something different than before. And on our way, the journey, we may like face a lot of like, like uh, fight back. Like people may don't know what we are really doing right now. They may have doubts, but, but we are still trying to uh, find our way to go through all these obstacles and to prove ourselves like uh, we are trying to transform in the way we are working and living now. And especially in the long-term care uh, scenarios, like people may need a new way to solve the old problems. Like we always know there's a shortage of care force, but it's not like when we include more care force can solve the, solve the problems, but we have to try to think of some other different ways to uh, tackle it. Thank you. Resilience and uh, also ambitious. Uh, that's what I can see from your uh, interview. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.